All right, I think everybody's pretty, probably pretty well settled in. We can get fired up today. Uh, this week is Right Bank Bordeaux. And I realize now um, the syllabus that was written for uh, our weekly webinars, I think is probably a bit too clustered together. I think I'll probably take a look at that. I, I'd really prefer to do something other than Bordeaux back-to-back -back weeks. Um, so we had a lot of spirits over the last month as well. I kind of like to recommend splitting up your studies when it comes to things like this so that you don't find yourself accidentally overlapping. Um, you know, if you have the opportunity to study left bank Bordeaux, uh, throw in sake with it, you know, something that's completely off, uh, off the radar and, and separate from what you're looking at so that you're not confusing it, um, you know, with terms that you're finding, let's say left bank versus right bank when it comes, uh, time to recall those terms. Okay. With that being said, um, you know, I think today's presentation is probably a little more than a half hour. Um, there's about 30 something slides here, I want to say 28 slides. Um, you'll see references too, to uh, both left bank and right bank. Um, so while this is really focused on right bank, you can't really separate the two completely. Uh, we could talk about obviously the wine laws and, and things that you'll see the different AOPs in the right bank and how they're different. Uh, but there will always be some need to reference back to the left bank of Bordeaux as well. Um, so last week, we sort of went over um, uh, approved styles of Bordeaux. And I think it's important if you are watching this um, that, that you realize what those are. I would highly recommend taking a look back at those slides uh, if you get the opportunity or if you haven't looked at them just yet. It's because it helps to really understand uh, what Entre du Mer is, um, what Bordeaux is, what Bordeaux su Superior is, um, and then all the different regions that produce um, dry red wines, dry white wines, and then sweet whites as well are super important to know. And when we talk about the right bank, it's pretty much red wine. So here we go. Let's dive in. Um, here you can see uh, the right bank sort of right in this area. Um, and I think I can zoom in on that too. Let's try and do that. Yep, <clears throat> and you find um, really the Dordogne River right here, and then the Garonne down through here that of course forms the Gironde estuary as it gets further up northwest. Uh, so the Dordogne River on the right bank of it, or the right side as we look at it from top down, is where we find the right bank of Bordeaux. And that's where you find Fronsac, Pomerol and its satellites, and then saint Emilion and its satellites. And then we'll talk a little bit too about um, you know, Bordeaux, Côte de Franc, and Côte de Castillon, and some Bly, and things like that. But this will be the area that we kind of focus on. And, you know, last week we went probably about 45 minutes talking mainly about the Madoc, uh, Graves, and then some of the sort of the sweet wines you'll find down in here. We also talked a lot last week about the Entre du Mer, which is a critical area to not forget about when you're studying. We can kind of get wrapped up in these quality wines uh, because of the price tags that we see on both the right bank and the left bank up here. Uh, but there's a ton of wine that comes out of here in the Entre du Mer and it's, it's really important to know what goes on there. All right. So pretty similar when we talk about climate and influences, but there are some, some major differences too. Um, here you have more of a continental climate uh, than maritime that you'll see on the left bank. Uh, the Atlantic Gulf Stream really brings that warm water up from the Caribbean, so this is just generic Bordeaux. Um, we talked about uh, the Dordogne and the Garonne, uh, and that's what, you know, Entre du Mer li lies between. When it comes to the right bank, you see the Barbon River uh, sort of bisecting through Pomerol. It just separates Pomerol from Nyack and the Vendée Pomerol and kind of cuts through saint Emilion, and to a lesser extent, the Isle River. No real mountains, a very flat plateau in Pomerol uh, and saint Emilion. You find a lot of humidity and frost. Um, and so in spring and in harvest, those are really the main hazards. And frost is a lot more prone on the right bank because it's a bit more continental, right? I think any time that you see uh, a region being defined as, as somewhat continental, um, you'll, you'll expect that you can find frost as an issue there. <clears throat> Uh, overall, Bordeaux is the most uh, rainy region of any French area, right, being that it's maritime um, and closest to the ocean here. Um, the right bank, of course, gets slightly less average rainfall, though, than the left bank because it is further inland and slightly more continental. 
Uh, your average elevation here, as we've talked about before, and if you remember on the left bank, we talk about sort of the plateau at Mouton and Ponte Cane on the left bank, uh, right at about 100 meters. There's not a lot of difference here. It's undulating uh, hills from 30 to about 100 meters above sea level. Uh, and we sit on a region two in the Winkler scale without a real diurnal shift. <clears throat> History in the region dates back to uh, really the fourth century. Um, I think we, we spoke previously about English control of the region from 1154 until 1453. And that really cemented the thirst for Bordeaux in England. And 60, 1663 is when we first see that uh, O'Brien being labeled and sold, uh, which of course leads to O'Brien. Um, in 1852, we find at Oidium, which is uh, powdery mildew, uh, phylloxera in 1869, and then in the 1880s, Pernospora, which is downy mildew. Um, <clears throat> Mouton really was the first to a state bottle in the 1924 uh, vintage. Um, this is an interesting thing to, to take a look at. You start seeing the state bottling in Burgundy and in Bordeaux sometime around the same, uh, same times in the 1920s and 30s. And then you start to see AOPs come online directly after that. This is really the modernization of winemaking. Um, and you can tell it's the, the regions that can afford estate bottling. It begins in Bordeaux and Burgundy, right? The, the wines that are fetching the highest prices and they have the capabilities um, to afford bottling on their own estate. By 1972, that becomes mandatory. So in addition to um, the Pernospora, um, the phylloxera, the powdery mildew of the late 19th century, you have great wars, pardon me, jump back to that, uh, leading all the way up until, of course, 1945 with the end of World War II. Then you see the devastating winter of 1956. So it really helps to separate Bordeaux into the haves and the haves nots. Uh, in 1999, Saint Emilion also became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's pretty interesting notes there. <coughs> Um, grape varieties, well, I guess we're probably familiar with these at this point, but we'll talk about it a bit, a bit more uh, in depth. The top three, of course, make up 99% of what you see on the right bank. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, of course, we think of that as being king on the left bank. It only really exists in small pockets on the right bank because of its late ripening nature. It really prefers those warmer gravel soils and it's susceptible to wood, wood rotting diseases, excuse me, like Esca and Utipa Dibac. Um, the thick skin sort of help it avoid rot and withstand the rainfalls that you see more so on the left bank. So it's not as necessary, right? We talked about um, last week, you know, our guests coming in and telling us they like blends and having that conversation of where blends begin and really uh, the reasoning behind it in Bordeaux being uh, survival, right? Um, so Cabernet Franc, otherwise common, not so commonly known as Boucher, um, is about 30% of your typical Saint Emilion blend. Uh, here it's adding acidity and aromatics to the heavier dose of Merlot, which is of course the backbone of the right bank, right bank excuse me. Uh, it is the most planted grape in all of Bordeaux, largely in part uh, due to the Bordeaux Superior wines and just Bordeaux AOP wines that are coming out of the Entrenou Mer area. Um, but most planted in Bordeaux and in France because it is somewhat winter hardy. It's exceedingly vigorous, and thus it prefers those, those cool clay soils that we see on the right bank uh, because they help to, uh, to mute some of that vigor and to uh, slow it down quite a bit. Uh, of course, the thinner skin is prone to more rot and calor as well, so it can be a little bit of an issue. Petite Verdot is not really allowed to exceed more than 10% of the blend and the quality AOPs, and we'll see that a bit more specifically as we get into those. It is a late ripening grape, and along with Muscadel, it's the only two grapes that aren't genetically related to all of the other Bordeaux grapes, which is an interesting little, little tidbit to, to know. Uh, Malbec, commonly known as Pressac in the right bank, arrived in saint emilion in 1730 from the Cahors region in southwest France. Sort of mid-ripening, definitely susceptible to uh, Calore, uh, which we referenced last week as being different from Milirondage. In Argentina, I think you see more Milirondage with it. Uh, but here I believe you just see straight up shatter, which is gaps in between your berries. Um, and its inability to, to be grafted really led to the demise uh, in Bordeaux. The same thing can be said with Carmenere. Neither one grafts as easily as some of these other grapes and thus um, fell out of favor. 
<clears throat> viticulturally speaking, the, the double guillot, I think, is the most common on the left bank, uh, whereas you'll see more single guillot on the right. And that has to do, and we'll talk more about this, uh, but with frost, um, which is pretty interesting to note. You know, as we mentioned earlier, these continental climates have a tendency to show uh, more susceptibility to frost. And so you'll see those single uh, single guillots. We'll take a look at those um, vine training methods from that wine folly slide that I've got coming up in just a minute. Uh, more commonly in Sautern, you'll actually find cordon. And I know this is, you know, not necessarily right bank, but I think it's important to, to note too. Um, and the reason you'll find cordon is because it produces smaller berries, which are more commonly prone to botrytis, which is something you're looking for in Graves and in Sautern specifically. But if you're not there, if you're producing guillot wines, or, or vine training method, excuse me, to produce wines, uh, you want your berries not to have uh, rot issues that you see um, in both the left and right bank because of the, the maritime climate. And so you want sort of bigger berries than what you're finding uh, than that cordon will help to produce. Uh, the Madoc on the left bank requires, you know, minimum 5,000 uh, vines per hectare just for generic AOP. More of the premiums you'll see about 7,000. On the right bank, it's lower density because you've got more coolness and shallowness of the soils are not nearly as well drained and deep. So you'll find more in that 5,000 to 5,500 range. Uh, the lowest density you'll find actually in Entre Mare is about 4,500 uh, vines per hectare, excuse me. Um, and then it, there's this sort of idea of what they call loop raisonné instead of organic uh, viticulture here in Bordeaux. And it just means do what must be done, right? So I think we're finding more and more today that people are getting away from using agrochemicals. We talked about what a, a pestilence um, the Bordeaux mixture actually can be to the, uh, the soils themselves. Uh, you're seeing people to sort of get away from that, but they're also not going to allow um, their final product to be damaged uh, by not taking action, right? Um, you know, we mentioned, I think, powdery and downy mildew, of course, are always constant threats. Rot can be avoided um, by intelligent deleafing, by removing leaves that are, um, you know, on the sun side. Uh, you keep the leaves, excuse me, on the sun side, remove them if they're on the other side, um, so that you don't get sunburn on your grapes, but you also can avoid more rot issues. Uh, and then we, of course, called out specifically Ponte Cane and Poyac for its biodynamic production. You also find that Chateau Clemens down in Sauternes is biodynamic. A couple that really stand out there for sure. And I think, um, you know, I wanted to mention here too, uh, obviously the differences in vine training methods. Wine Folly and Madeline over at Wine Folly does a phenomenal job at putting together infographics. And I find when I'm studying that they really, really help. Uh, so we talked about Sauternes being more of that cordon driven. And so, uh, of course, you have these woody uh, air, little stems that kind of come out, right? Um, and guillot is little thin ones, and then your shoots come off of those. And so the woody ones can have a tendency to be injured um, when it comes to frost. Um, so you, you'll find uh, the guillot, and particularly the single guillot on the right bank, a lot more common. These other ones you'll find from around the world are always cool to look at. And of course, my favorite being the Calara, probably, that you'll find in, um, in Santorini in Greece. Vinification. Um, Bordeaux, of course, as with that uh, being one of the first to a state bottle in the 1920s, uh, well, today they still have, you know, as we mentioned, they are the haves for sure. Uh, they have the funds to have all of the cool toys, and you're starting to see more and more innovation come through in Bordeaux, including things like optical and density sorters, which are super, super cool. Some of your really tiny right bank properties, um, like Le Pen and others, are destemming by hand. Um, you'll see vacuum distillation and reverse osmosis uh, in the really well-funded chateau that help to concentrate their must so that they can really get a lot of extraction. Of course, you'll find pump over is more common than, um, uh, than punch downs because you're trying to avoid over extraction here, whereas you might see more pigeage, say, in, in Burgundy, where they're trying to pull everything they can out of, um, you know, the, the delicate fruit that is Pinot Noir. Here they're trying to avoid over extraction with big fruity, juicy Merlot, uh, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Typically in white wines in Bordeaux, you'll find that malolactic is voided. That's a very generic statement. Um, Microoxygenation has kind of been around since the 1990s. 
Uh, and then you'll see plicage, uh, sort of a new thing that's somewhat controversial. Uh, this is where they're adding small doses of oxygen um, to finished wine that's actually in the barrel. Um, typically on the right bank, you'll find about a 70-30 Merlot Cabernet Franc blend. I think we mentioned, of course, uh, the right bank reaches its peaks at about 90 meters. Cool clay and calcareous throughout the right bank. And we'll get into soil types as we look at each of the satellite AOPs too. Uh, regional AOPs are Bordeaux, Bordeaux Superior, and Cremant de Bordeaux. And I think it's important that American oak is allowed in both the Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior levels, interesting enough. Your sub-regional AOPs are uh, Madoc, Entre du Mer, and then Côte de Bordeaux. And then your village AOPs, such as Pomerol. Um, we'll get into those a little bit more specifically. Um, and then for wine laws, the 225 liter barrique uh, sort of didn't come into favor until about the 1860s. <clears throat> so this is after, you know, the classifications were, were written, right? Uh, on the left bank, at least. The saint Emilion classification, of course, came online in 1955. It was enacted in 1958. Eventually, it shifted to the INAO in 2012 after uh, all those 2006 demotions were fought in court. So the INAO analyzes soil, topography, viticultural, and winemaking techniques. Um, to get into the specific AOPs, we'll start with saint Emilion. Um, so saint Emilion and its satellites were established in 1936. This is shortly after that estate bottling begins at, at Mouton Ross Shield and of course before it's mandated. Uh, but really these are sort of the, the first few um, regions that, that came online in France for AOP. <clears throat> of course this is red wine only. You'll see the minimum ABV at 11, 53 hectoliters per hectare, no more than 10% Petit Bordeaux and an April 15th release date. Uh, the ideal soil here is, is the limestone coats of the plateau and then the, gra the grobs really in the northwest corner where you'll find more Cabernet Sauvignon um, with Figiac, which of course is a, a Cabernet dominant right bank producer, and Cheval Blanc, uh, which is pretty heavy on their Cabernet Franc. Uh, then you'll find more sandy soils that occupy the land nearest uh, the rivers of Barbon and Dordogne. Um, Oh, and we mentioned that here, of course, near Libourne, uh, Saint-Emilion, 1954 uh, and 55, the classification renews every 10 years. Uh, again, that legal challenge in 2006 led to it being taken over by the INAO. It's important to note too that Saint-Emilion is its own AOP and Saint-Emilion Grand Cru is a separate AOP. Now, uh, the Grand Cru class and Premier Grand Cru class exist as appellations until 1984. <laughs> but then they were relegated uh, to just being classifications of Sant Emilion Grand Cru. Very important to note. So this came online, uh, as we mentioned before, in 54. Of course, red wine only and estate bottled. Um, same geographic boundaries as Normale, uh, but you have a heightened alcohol content by half percent, slightly less yield, and a month later release date. Uh, and then, of course, it's broken down into Grand Cru, Grand Cru Clos, Premier Grand Cru Clos, both A and B. And these are the ones that um, probably we get asked about most commonly and of course fetch the highest prices. But I think there's a lot of great value and wonderful wines to be found in the lower tiers too. Um, I sort of broke this down into the two original uh, Grand Cru Class A, Primer Grand Cru Class A, uh, and then the two new ones. So you'll find Cheval Blanc, of course, is uh, an OG, if you will, uh, sitting in that Northwestern uh, uh, Graves area uh, over gravel and clay soil with a little bit of limestone. The vines at the site really date back to the 15th century. Uh, Jean-Jacques Ducasse purchased the estate in 1832, labeled it as Cheval Blanc in 52, and then sold it to the current owners of LVMH and Baron Albert Frere in 1998. Um, well, at least his family did, I would assume. Uh, Arnaud also owns uh, Chateau de Cap, uh, notably. It's usually about 50-50 Cab Franc and Merlot. Um, that retail price may actually be higher today. And the second label is Le Petit Cheval. And then you have Chateau Asson, uh, which sits in that same Graves area over sand with clay and limestone. Uh, named for the fourth century poet Ausonius, started in the 18th century, but didn't shine really until Pascal Dalbach took over in 1976. <coughs> Michel Roland uh, joined the team in 2002, notably. Uh, you'll hear his name. I think we talked about it a little bit on the left bank. We'll hear it a little bit more today too. Uh, vineyards are here are planted to 50-50 Merlot and Cab Franc, which is, of course, the Insta Parchment. 
Uh, the annual production is about 2,000 cases, $600 retail, and second label is Chapelle Valsone. In 2012, we got two new Premier Grand Cru Class A's, and that's Chateau Pavi. Pavi translates to peaches. Um, here you'll find white and brown limestone of clay subsoils, founded in 1867, sold back and forth until uh, Gerard Percé buys it in 98. He completely guts the estate, rebuilds it from the ground up, hires Michel Roland, bam, he gets uh, Premier Grand Cru Class A uh, classification in 2012. <clears throat> Typically a higher proportion of Merlot here and less Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, the retail price is a touch lower at 450 and your second label is Arome de Pavi since 2005. Uh, previously it was called Tour sur Marne and I think there might be some relation to Chateau Simard that you'll find more of that value driven Saint Emilion uh, that you can get on your wine list for usually under 100 bucks or so. Sometimes with some age. Uh, Chateau Angelou, uh, otherwise known as Angel's Bells, sits over clay and sand again with pockets of limestone. You're seeing a, a common theme here where we're finding limestone as being uh, sort of the best soil types um, below the Saint Emilion great wines. This is founded in 1872, owned by the De Bouard family to this day. They also own Bellevue, Le Fleur de Bouard, and Chateau de Franc. Uh, and anybody want to just wager a guess who might consult for them? Yeah, that's right, Michel Roland. Uh, usually about 50% Merlot with a heavier dose of Franc. Um, that, that retail price around $600. Second label is Carillon d'Angelou, and they have a third label that's simply called Number Three d'Angelou since 2007, which is kind of cool. Uh, notable Premier Grand Cru Class B wines, um, I think that are super important. Valens Road, of course, uh, inspired that garagiste moment, uh, movement, excuse me, Figiac. Uh, for being Cabernet Sauvignon, La Mondote, which was uh, promoted in 2012 and simply launched in 1996. Chateau Canon and Canon Le Gaffelier, uh, Beauze Jour Bicot, uh, and then their second label, Tournelle de Beauze Jour Bicot, and then just Beauze Jour, and Croix de Beauze Jour is their second label. And I think we um, had a question about Trotnoy too recently. <coughs> Saint Emilion satellites. So as we looked at the map, um, these are sort of the outlying regions to the northeast and east area of Sa uh, Saint Emilion as you follow the Barbon River um, and in between the Barbon and Dordogne to the east. Uh, and I should probably throw another map in here that might help. Uh, but established in 1936 with that same uh, minimum ABV and yield, um, Lusac and Puis again uh, capped the Petit Verdot and Carbonara at about 10% of the blend and it really released no sooner than April 15th. You'll notice that April and May 15th were your Saint Emilion and then Saint Emilion Grand Cru dates. Um, the local co-op here is called Producteurs Réunis. Uh, 20 to 40% of Cuisigan and Lusac respectively um, go into that. Uh, Montagne and Saint-Georges don't have any blend limit on the lesser varieties and are released no sooner than March 31st. So you kind of can see that they think that Lusac and Cuisigan are probably the more quality uh, uh, satellites in general. And uh, St. George can label itself as Montagne if they choose. Pomerol, and this is important to note, um, crossed a fair or the iron rich sand with blue clay, of course, is ideal. And the clay hard pan comes closest to the surface right around Petrus, and that sits on the, on the plateau, otherwise known as the Boutonniere. And you really have three separate terraces, the crossed the fair on the second and the Boutonniere uh, at the top, just 20 hectares, that's it. <clears throat> we'll take a look at a picture I found of that that's actually really cool. Um, minimum ABV is 11% with a much later release date of November 15th, no Carmenere allowed. Uh, Palmer and Liborn are the two uh, accepted communes of production. Uh, there's no official classification system, of course. Cab Franc making a resurgent in recent years, um, I think due largely in part to global warming. Uh, and it is sandwiched by the Isle and Barbound Rivers and then separated from Lalonde, which is on the northern portion, uh, by the Barbon River. And roughly, you'll find about 800 hectares of vineyards. Great producers here. Well, start with Petrus. That's where you begin, right? Uh, about $2,000 a bottle retail, and that's probably higher today. <clears throat> no second wine. It's owned by the, the Moyo family. They shun that Garagis label and have more of a terroir focus. Um, they don't like manipulating the wine. They have blue clay in the vineyards. Uh, typically 100% Merlot. Um, it says here imported by Vineyard Brands. There's a handful. Everybody's an importer for Petrus. If you can get your hands on it, you can get it. 
Uh, Chateau Le Pen, um, which uh, neighbors and is produced alongside Vue Chateau Sertan, uh, both owned by the Danpont family. Uh, Trottenoy, uh, which we mentioned earlier, owned by the Moyot family. Uh, Le Fleur, um, which their second label is Le Pensis de Le Fleur, and quite a value at that uh, price point. Uh, Petit Village run by AXA Insurance with Garen Court Consulting. Here we go, getting into the insurance companies that we mentioned owning most of the left bank. And here's that beautiful blue clay soil that you see uh, at Petrus. Pretty stunning, to be honest with you. <clears throat> the lesser Pomeroles, I guess, uh, and I hate to call them lesser, still delicious wines that come out of there, but Lavande de Pomerol and Nayak are the two communes of production for Lavande de Pomerol, which of course is on the northern side of the Barbon River, um, sitting at you know that same 11% ABV, 53 hectoliters per hectare, and that March 31st release date. Similar soil to Pomerol, but not as much of that crust affair uh, that we look for in the qualities. To the west, and we've sort of moved east to west here today, you'll find Fronsac and Canon Fronsac. Um, these are separated by that Isle River that we mentioned. Uh, about 1,100 hec uh, hectares, similar ABVs and, and uh, yields, um, came on board in the 1930s as well. Really, uh, the only producer, I put we, and I apologize for that, I don't want to give away what what place I was working at at the time, but uh, Moulin Pelebrie, uh, and I think that's Lubri, uh, misspelling. Uh, fantastic producer, and you can typically find them for a really good price. So Cannon uh, is south-facing hillsides, and then Fronsac has hillside and valley vineyards. And here, oddly enough, you'll find the highest percentage of Chinese ownership in all of Bordeaux today. You know, I mentioned, um, yes, we're going to focus on right bank, but I think it's always important to talk about Entre de Mer because of the size of it and the amount of grapes that are coming out of there. Uh, so per the AOP, it's dry white wines, but Merlot really dominates the vineyards, and it goes into those Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior wines. Nearly three quarters of them are produced here. <clears throat> so it's got 1,500 hectares for the AOP, but there's 40,000 hectares in the area. It's huge, right? It's the coolest area for growing grapes. <clears throat> Unless you have high trained vines to encourage airflow and avoid frost. Um, then you'll find uh, these other two, what we call, I guess, satellite areas in, uh, in Borg, uh, which is further northwest. And then you'll find, we'll talk about Bly too, further northwest as well. Uh, these are Rouge, but with no Petit Verdot or Carmenere, and a little bit of Blanc Sec. So established in that same area, 1936, uh, 1941, the Whites came on board. The minimum ABVs you'll find lower. Here you find a lot of sharp cliffs and ridges, very windy and very variable soils. Merlot, of course, is the king, but Cabernet Sauvignon still has about 20%. And then your highest concentration of Pressac, otherwise known as Malbec, again, in all of Bordeaux is here about 10%. Great producer um, known as Rock de Combs, sort of leading the charge for quality winemaking. They were bought in 1987 uh, by Francois Mitiaville. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to know how to pronounce that, but I think I'm close. Uh, it was the owner of Church Rotebuf uh, from saint Emilion, and his first vintage was 1998. Great wines. And then Bly, until Cognac was delimited in 1909, much of this was just given and distilled in the Chiron. Um, Merlot is the king, Cab's less reliable than Borg, but still number two. Um, the Cote de Bordeaux, excuse me, debuted in 2009 to sort of rebrand and market the tertiary appellations. Um, this is like Merlot-driven blends, right? And it comes with four subzones. You get Franc for Rouge or Blanc Sec, Bly for Rouge or Blanc Sec, Cadillac for Rouge only, and then Cote de Bord Castillon is Rouge only. Um, so you see a lot of Sun Emilion producers that flood here because it's a less expensive area with really, really great production going on. So look for Cote de Bordeaux Castillon. I think we mentioned earlier, uh, Mouton was the first to bottle in 1924. Um, so that's important to, to note sort of the history of Bordeaux <clears throat> over the last 100 years and the rise of it, I think both in our, um, in our programs and sort of where it's come to today. I mean, is it, is it approachable? Are people still drinking it? Are they fearful of the price? Are they fearful of um, being old and stodgy? Uh, but we'll see where it leads as we creep up on the 100-year anniversary of Mouton being the first to a state bottle there here in the next few years. Um, that's my show for today. I hope everybody enjoys a little Bordeaux. 
this week. Um, I will note today that we will not be having a webinar next week. I'll be in uh, beautiful San Sebastian um, in Northern Spain. So I'll take some good pictures and make sure and add those to a, a presentation for the future. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed it and uh, cheers. We'll see you guys in a couple weeks.